You're listening to Now I've Heard Everything, conversations with the icons of our time. I never wanted to be what people think I am or what I was told I should be. Uh, I'm trying desperately. My greatest long in life is, is to be who I am. Singer, songwriter, John Denver. Today on Now I've Heard Everything, I'm Bill Thompson. When John Denver died in a plane crash in October of 1997, the world lost not just a very popular singer, but a very talented songwriter whose music touched the hearts of millions of fans worldwide. Among the 300 or so songs that he recorded over his career, he wrote some 200 of them. He had 33 gold records, and and he was uncommonly successful at crossing genre lines. He was country, he was top 40, he was adult contemporary. In fact, Colorado and West Virginia have each adopted a John Denver song as their official state song. In 1994, John Denver published his autobiography, a book he called Take Me Home. And that's when I had the chance to meet him. Now, a bit of context for this interview. First of all, his book was rather rather frank. It was rather candid. He told some stories in there that he probably would have rather not told, but he wanted to be truthful. So he had some episodes that were, well less than complimentary to himself. And one such episode was about a a terrible argument he had with Annie, and he ended up cutting their dining room table in half with a chainsaw in a fit of anger. Now, that was one small anecdote in this very large and comprehensive book. But the other piece of information you need to know is just before he came to see me that day, he had come from one of those morning zoo talk shows where the disc jockeys try to outdo each other with how raunchy and how outrageous they can be. They had him as a guest on their show. I don't know why. All they wanted to talk about, apparently, was this one anecdote, the chainsaw in the dining room table incident. They didn't want to talk about his book. They didn't want to talk about his music. They just wanted to talk about that stupid anecdote that he was that he tossed in there because he wanted to be frank and candid and honest about his life. And it left him rattled. So when he showed up to my studio for, for our interview, I could tell he was uncomfortable. He was probably in a foul mood. He probably didn't want to be there at the moment. He wasn't sure what he was going to get from me. But it's in moments of crisis like that that a person's true character comes out. And John Denver was... Nothing but kind and gentle and courteous and respectful to me. So here now, from 1994, John Denver. Why did you write this book? I was asked, and uh, in thinking about it, about whether or not I wanted to, I, I looked at the fact that I hear from people every day around the world who, who say that my music has changed their lives or saved their lives. Uh, or had a real powerful impact on their lives. And I felt if that was the case, then perhaps it might be of value also to know what's behind the music. And uh, I know that people listen to music, and I've learned that they read to find out that they're not alone. And so there's value in someone uh, you know, saying what is so about their lives, I think, so that people know that they are not alone. Is reaching a 50th birthday also something of a of an inspiration, uh, something of a oh, milestone? I, I think so. Uh, not so much just the fact of the, of the 50th birthday, but, but there just has been an awful lot that has gone on in my life in these first 50 years, and, uh, and quite a story, at least uh, it seemed to me, in rounding this up over the last three years, quite a story to tell. And uh, I feel like I've got a whole another another life out there ahead of me and so i was real happy to uh, to take the time to put this one together was it difficult for you to decide going into this project how frank you wanted to be with this book no i wanted to be as honest as i possibly could uh, i think if there's any value in my story it's going to come out of the truth of it not uh, the story glossed over or uh, superficialized in any way or or directed one way or another to have people, you know, sort of 
I don't want to be what I never wanted to be what people think I am or what I was told I should be. Uh, I'm trying desperately. My greatest long in life is is to be who I am, uh, to find out who I am, and uh, to have the courage to be that. And so that's all that's worth sharing. Does it trouble you though that some people will immediately turn to the parts? Well, let's see what he says about Annie. Let's see what he says about that. That you know, this disaster or that disaster. Or... I don't think they turn to the parts that way unless they hear it. <laughs> stuff on the radio or read it in the newspapers right. from people asking the sensationalized parts. You know. It's uh, it's irritating. I mean, I just did an interview with a guy, and all he asked me about was, what, what did Don Henley write a song, Dirty Laundry? And there's plenty of dirty laundry in the book. There's also some, some great things, some great stories, and some stuff that I think people would be interested in. And... Uh, you know they're gonna they're gonna read whatever they're gonna read out of the book. I hope they read the whole thing, not I, just what people point out to them. I've been interviewing authors for years, and they are all they all share your frustration at the fact that the tabloids or the tabloid shows or radio talk show hosts will choose the one or two lines, the one or two quotes, the one or two stories, and characterize the whole book that way. And there's really a whole lot more to the book. There's a whole lot more to your life than those stories. The lowest common denominator, what's most sensational, what's going to sell, what's going to get the biggest numbers. I read an interesting thing, uh, Sir John Goldsmith, talking about the economy and the state of the world and the World Trade Agreement, uh, saying that we have come to measure success by numbers, not by understanding. And it seems to me that everything that goes on in journalism uh, is pointed in that, in that very same direction. That's how it got to be that way. However, when you talk about numbers, you've got some very impressive numbers when you talk about the kind of success of of your songs. Those those numbers are very impressive. I've been very lucky. But the, but you know, coming back to what you said a moment ago, your songs have touched so many of us so deeply. Not just we like to hear a good song on the radio, that's cute, you know, and we can hum along and things like that, but when you listen to the words, when you actually listen to what you're saying to us in those songs, those songs really have a significant meaning to so many of us. Why do you suppose that is? Well, for one thing, we can understand the words. <laughs> I mean, there's, I mean when, it's I mean, a good start. <laughs> I mean, I, I heard you mention that, that you were on uh, on uh, any number of karaoke machines uh, all over the world. Well, well, of course you are. You can understand the words, and they mean something. They they have something uplifting to say. Well, I I think that's the, the, there's two things there. One is you can understand the words. I think that what I what I write about and why it's become successful all over the world is because. Uh, it relates to people out of their own sense of themselves, that, that my songs are about uh, human nature and, and what is common in all of us uh, that is beyond, I think, the circumstances or the particular events. You know, I think Annie's song reflects not only the way that I felt about this particular woman in my life at that particular time, but what any man longs for and uh, and hopefully finds or or feels in uh, in the partner that he's chosen. Do you know to this day in the summertime when I have my window open at night when I go to bed and I can hear the traffic on the interstate a mile or so over from my house I always think of the line there's a truck out on the four lane back uh, home again. That's yeah. right. And and it just uh, because that song is so soothing and so peaceful and evokes so many memories. My home is not your home. I mean I didn't grow up where you grew up. But it just, it instantly takes me back. I can remember all the, we didn't have a four lane near our house. We had, it was still two lane then, but you could hear trucks rolling by at night. Yeah, and, and uh, the memory of that song, and, and actually, you know, both in, uh, in Aspen where I wrote the song and, and uh, what the picture in part conjured up for me, both of those were two lane highways also. I, but also, as you point out in the book, you were not a nine to five songwriter. You didn't come down in the office and sit no, down at that desk and say, I'm going to be creative. That's not how I do it. Uh, uh, the songs come to me. They come when they come. Uh, it's a, it's always a wonderful thing to me to discover a song. And, uh, and it's uh, especially wonderful sometimes when it comes on so strongly that it really takes over your life. And, I mean, you can't do anything until you finish the song. How early in your life did you know that music would be your life? Well, I... I don't know when I when I knew that that would be my life. Uh, there was a very conscious point in college when I decided to drop out of college to either get music out of my system 
so I could go to school seriously or to see how far I could go with my music. And uh, I don't know even today that it's, that I would say that music is my life, but it certainly is the predominant force in my life. It, it is a major part of your life, but, uh, but again, coming back to something you said a moment ago, this book is more than just the music. It is more than just the bad times and more than just the good times. It really is a, a very well-rounded portrait of who you are, which is, I gather, what you intended with it. Absolutely. Thank you. D is this the kind of book, in its finished form now, is this more or less the way you thought it would turn out, the, the way you hoped it would? Uh yeah, the way I I hoped it would. There's there's a lot of stories that I uh, I'd love to also be able to share with people. Some of the stories of of learning my business, learning uh, the the history of rock and roll, some of the things that happen to you when you're out on the road. I mean, there's some funny stories, some heartbreaking stories there. Uh, there are the kinds of people I've met and and worked with and. Uh, you know, I just think there could be a lot of other books, and I think this would be a, d a different book today out of the things I've learned in the last six months since we finished it. But, uh, you know, that's that's my story up until that time about six months ago. Does does success in whatever your chosen field enable you to do the things that you always dreamed of doing? I mean, did you, did you, when you can buy a plot of land and call it Windstar, can you, uh, you know, something like that? Well, I, I, I think success does open a lot of doors, and it creates enormous opportunities, and it also creates enormous responsibilities. So it's how uh, and what you choose to do with your success. And that's when you find out what kind of person you really are, isn't it? I think so, yeah. And some of the people that you've met over the years, I gather, have shown that they are, they've lived up to the kind of person they really are, and others have, have not. Well, I think all of us uh, generally sooner or later show ourselves and sometimes uh, what you find out is, is what you anticipated, what you hoped for, and sometimes uh, people let you down. In your 50-plus year quest to find out who you really are, have, have you completed the quest? No, I don't think so. I, I think it's an ongoing uh, uh, pursuit. I think life is a, is a, a process of uh, unfoldment. And uh, uh, it's a it's a constant uh, a continual discovery for me each and every day, and and within each and every day there are the lessons that you learn uh, about how how you want to represent yourself in certain situations. Uh, I'm thinking of. Uh, I, I just came from an interview, you see, and I've been doing this now for, this is the 12th or 13th day, the 12th or 13th city, and uh, and I've been on the road basically since the first week of July, and, uh, and I lost my temper earlier today, and doggone it, I hate it when I do that. Actually, I don't know if I lost my temper, but I did, did get angry, and I let the fellow know you know, how I felt. And I don't know if I needed to do that. And uh, that's how it goes. Well, if I may say, you you have the look about you of someone who is a little weary of, a, of an author tour at this point, is a little weary of being asked the same questions over and over and over again in the same form over and over and over again. Well, it's not always that. And, and sometimes when, when, when you sit down with someone, you expect them not to ask the question that everybody else has asked. That's one of the reasons you're doing the interview with uh, some people who you've done that before with, and uh, and it's disappointing when they go for the same bullshit, if you'll pardon the expression, that everybody else seems to go for or wants to go for, present company excluded, of course. <laughs> Thank you. So far. Well, what you <laughs> But you do understand that we are caught between a rock and a hard place as well because our general public says, why didn't you ask him about this? Why didn't you ask him about that? And, oh, why didn't you ask him about uh, you know, that, that Take Me Home Country Road song? That's my favorite song. You should have asked him about that. Some of those I do understand, and, and some of them I don't. Well, I mean, certainly there are certain aspects. I mean, 
you're here to talk about the book. You know, I'm, I, I have no problem with that, but I've, I know in other interviews you've been asked about things that have nothing to do with the book, that are not in the book, that have nothing to do with the book, and I, I, I can sympathize with your weariness in having to address those questions, and I will not address any of those questions to you in a, in a further way. Well, and I'll uh, answer whatever I'm asked. You know. <laughs> it's just uh, uh, when, it, when it is only one side of the story, when it leans on uh, the superficial or the sensational, uh, it gets aggravating after a while. Well, I, I, personally, I am much more interested in finding out the origins of the songs that I've been listening to for all these years. I'm fascinated by the path that every performer must take on their way to the top because it looks so easy. Once you're at the top, boy, he's on TV. He's got records. He's uh, all over the place. It must have must have been a snap, but we don't realize all the clubs you had to play uh, play in at uh, you know fifty bucks a night or a hundred bucks a night or. Well, and, and and the other thing I think that comes out that's sort of like that is uh, you know aside from all of the clubs. What about the club where uh, it was an L-shaped room and over there in the corner of the L was where the bar was? And what about the folks who were so inconsiderate when you're filling the place every night and what they choose to do is go empty their bucket of ice into their aluminum sink during the middle of your softest ballad? <laughs> you know, people don't don't know that story. They don't know how that affects you when you're out there uh, pouring your heart and soul out to somebody and trying to, to really give them whatever the song is and something like that goes on. Or the waitress comes down right in front of you when you're singing a song and asks these guys what they want for drinks. They're oblivious and you're the guy, you know, they're paying you for the crowd that you're bringing in. And hopefully they're paying you something more than, more than what your hotel bill is going to be and what you, what you need to live on. Which was not the case the first time I worked here in Washington, D.C., yeah, uh, you you had uh, what the the cellar door was that the name of the place? Cellar door, and I was staying at uh, right across the Key Bridge, at the probably Holiday far, Inn. Probably not far from here, I would guess. Not far at all, no. And uh, the Holiday Inn, I don't know if it's still here now. There, uh, uh, there is a Holiday Inn over here. I don't know if that's the same one. Yeah, and uh, my room bill was more than my salary that week. <laughs> and that was what? That was uh, late sixties, was it not? Nineteen sixty-five. <laughs> Well, again, it looks, you know, by the time you've already made it, it looks so easy. My gosh, he made a movie with George Burns. It must have, you know, he must have. But, by the way, I wanted to ask about that. You only made it two or three quick mentions. That's one of my favorite movies. We've got it on tape. We've watched it over and over and over again. You were such an endearing character in that movie. Oh, well, thanks. Did you, did you, did you I, enjoy making the movie as much as we've enjoyed watching it? I enjoyed it enormously, and I would really like to do more films. And I think uh, one of the biggest mistakes that I ever made was not pursuing pursuing films more ardently after the success of Oh God. We particularly liked it because at the time we owned an AMC Pacer identical to the one your character <laughs> drove in that movie. <laughs> Did it rain inside of yours? Well, yes, because the weather stripping was oh. all gone. <laughs> John Denver was 53 when he died in that small plane crash in 1997. Now you can get a copy of Take Me Home by John Denver by tapping the link in our show notes or by going to our website, HeardEverything.com. We may earn an Amazon commission if you make a purchase. HeardEverything.com is where you'll also hear my 1994 interview with another music legend, Glenn Campbell. I wanted to get in the studios. I wanted to be the musician rather than, you know, playing six nights a week in a club, which I had been doing for eight years. And my 1989 conversation with a man whose songs touched millions, Jimmy Buffett. Margaritaville, is, it, you know, I don't feel like it's something that I've been strapped with. I'm very happy that it occurred, and uh, there's a lot more substance to me than just one song. But if that's what I'm remembered for, that's fine with me. And don't forget, you can find all 500 episodes of Now I've Heard Everything that we posted so far at HeardEverything.com. And we post new episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And you can find us everywhere you listen to podcasts. And thank you so much for listening. Next time on Now I've Heard Everything, she was a major star in the 1950s, the 60s, the 70s, and by 1986 or so, she also became very well known for something else. Her dabbling in the metaphysical and her belief in past lives and reincarnation. My 1987 interview with Shirley MacLaine. I began to have these deja vu experiences that were quite profound. I knew that I had been somewhere before. 
And yet, in this particular life, I hadn't been. That's next time on Now I've Heard Everything. I'm Bill Thompson.